contention in our top four here. Let's go and see some more magic. Hello and welcome to this round 13 here at Grand Prix Bologna. I'm Tim Willoughby along with Hall of Famer Frank Carsten here and we're going to get a chance to see Enrico Baldrati, Federico Ronchi and Marco Malatesta up against Panagiotis, Papadopoulos, Alexa Tellerov and Stefan Suchik in what is likely to be a match that is pretty much gets someone very, very close to making our top four. Just a few rounds remaining and with the way that the draws have been panning out, we think that even if you miss the X2 record, it's still potentially possible it might be able to make the top four and get to draft later on here on Sunday. And the match that we're starting with here, Enrico Badrati against Panagiotis Papadopoulos. Both players green. Uh, on the left of our screen, Enrico Badrati, he started things off green-black. Uh, on the other side of things, green-white, but both players all about the fungus. Yep. Uh, the fungal plot that uh, Baldrati played on turn two is not really going to do much until uh, the late game, but when you get there, uh, it can turn any two Sepralinks into a fresh card, some life, you know, turn uh, dead creatures into additional Sepralinks, so a strong late game engine. Uh, the Sepraling migration, obviously better on, uh, on turn two. Also better with Song of <laughs> Freilies, but that is now on Baldrati's side. Ooh. However, a sap herd is a perfectly reasonable uh, way of adding up creatures on the battlefield. With Song of Freilies, you really want to try and get as many creatures as you can in play for the point that it gets to its third chapter, because that's where you get an essentially completely free attack. Your creatures get plus one, plus one, Vigilance, Trample, and Indestructible. So just one turn away, uh, that will happen. In the meantime, though, there's definitely a t strong temptation for Enrico Baldrati to tap all of those creatures in the noble goal of making still more creatures. Oh boy! <laughs> yeah, th this is a very powerful combo. We might even see this in standard. Sepraling Migration and Song of Freelies. Uh, doesn't even matter which order you play it in, you'll definitely get some, uh, some value. But now, on the next turn, that song is gonna sing the final, uh, the final song, and that will turn all of Baldrati's creatures <laughs> Uh, into uh, uh, bigger, uh, bigger ones. I guess a song doesn't sing the last song. That's this true, is the final but, uh, chorus. That's, that's this was the final countdown to the final chorus. We're yeah. in Europe. It makes sense. Uh, and all of these creatures getting their plus one, plus one counters, and absolutely no reason for them not to get stuck into the red zone here. They're indestructible. They've got vigilance, so it's a completely free attack. And with trample and those plus one, plus one counters, this represents a reasonable amount of damage. Yeah, I think we briefly ran out of uh, dice for the table. Actually, I have to reach over to another table in the feature match area. Because, uh, yeah, eight dice, that's a lot on the table. Song of Freelies has got to be one of the better uncommons in the set. Especially when you pair it with cards like Sepraling Migration. And this is going to be a big attack. Uh, all of them have Vigilance, all of them are indestructible. Uh, trample too, so it's the easiest Alpha Strike ever. Settle the score dealing with the biggest blocker before that was even going to be a factor. Yep. Yeah, so this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 15 damage coming Papadopoulos' Papa way. I guess you can chum block one, but that doesn't even work because they all have trample. Yeah, this is just uh, a massive attack. If you're putting together a sap rolling deck, be it in constructed no, no, or in limited, this is it, roughly it where you want to be doing. It doesn't die, it has indestructible too. <laughs> put that dead bloom talent back. Yep. <laughs> a little bit keen to put the, uh, the thalid in the graveyard, but no need. And now Panagiotis Papadopoulos needs to fight back from five life with so many creatures on the battlefield, all of which have plus one plus one counters on the other side of things. It's going to be a big ask. Yeah, well, I mean, it's still possible if he is able to play another blocker and maybe a removal spell. He might be able to, uh, to stabilize from this point. But, yeah, obviously, Baldrati is in the driver's seat here. Shalai. Shalai. Well, uh, currently, Papadopoulos has four blockers for eight creatures on Baldrati's side. So, if nothing else changes, then Papadopoulos could actually uh, survive here. In fact, Baldrati doesn't have great attacks because his biggest creatures will be uh, will be eaten. Oh, well, I just miscounted it. They're, they're counters, of course, not uh, just a temporary boost. So it's actually eight damage, not four coming Papadopoulos' way. Um, so even if he has an additional removal spell, 
can take out one of the Zapperlings, but there's still six damage coming uh, coming his way. Yeah, that, that Song of Free Release is just incredible. Yeah, one of the most potent cards in the set. If you're in draft and you see it early, take it. If you see it late, possibly still take it. It's a very, very powerful one that doesn't really take too much work to uh, set up a big, big attacking turn. Yep. Now the the Papadopoulos Teleroth Suzech team is a bit more experienced. Uh, Papadopoulos was the well uh, part of the Greek team that won the World Magic Cup Championships in 2016. Alexa Teleroth, who we're going to see right now, three GP top eights, and their final teammate Stepjan Suzech also has uh, like a GP top eight before. So they are a bit more experienced. And here we see ooh, the Coldwater Snapper getting in. Good old 4-5 Hexproof. Now, as I recall from having seen a little bit of Alexa Telerov's deck in previous rounds, he is sporting kind of a spicy one, multiple Planeswalkers that he's working with oh in yeah. his principally blue-black deck. A little white splash to help him cast Teferi. Does not need any of that splash, though, in order to be able to cast Karn, Karn Scion of Urza. No Planeswalker in sight yet. And... You know, even without Planeswalkers, the board seems slightly favored for Teleroth, but it's it's really close. But this is the thing that changes things around. Teleroth's deck also replete with removal. Settle the score, already been played. Vicious Offering now dealing with that uh, Sphinx. And this is really going to be a tricky spot for Federico Ronchi. As with each and every removal spell played on a premium creature, he just has to stare down that snapper and wonder what went wrong. Yep. Snapper is particularly good against uh, blue-red decks. If you play the 4-5 the Hexproof against uh, a green deck, well, they'll just often just play a bigger dude uh, for 6 mana. Green has access to, for example, a 7-6 creature. But if you play against blue-red, that's an archetype that cares more about instants and sorceries. Uh, even, like, creatures that only tap for mana that you can spend on instants and sorceries. So it's pr quite possible that Ranchi is holding a bunch of removal spells or bounce cards that he would love to uh, spend on the on the turtle, but is just not able to. Well, if he's holding on to cards, he may, f may find himself regretting it as all of a sudden Caligo Skinwitch comes down with Kicker. That's going to be a mind drop in addition to the 1-3 body. Two cards discarded for Federico Ranchi here. <laughs> wow. That's Wizard's Lightning, and was it actually in Bolas's clutches? It was. That was a very, very potent Caligo Skin Witch. Yeah, and, well, I mean, another example of why the Hexproof of uh, the Coldwater Snapper is so powerful against these blue red decks. Uh -oh. Hang on, though. Nine mana. Yeah, I mean, something had to be up, uh, given that he discarded those two powerful cards and still kept one in hand. I mean, Fight with Fire is good, still doesn't kill the Snapper. I mean, what does, really? The Snapper, it'll outlive us all. I, I haven't seen a game where Fight with Fire was kicked while it wasn't enough for that player to win the game, but this might be one where that actually happens. Alexa like Telerov casts Blink of an Eye to return one of his creatures. He's still going to be taking a little hit here, but ultimately this is a race that Alexa Telerov is still looking pretty good in. At 9 life, he can afford to take a little hit. Casts Caligo Skin Witch again, gets rid of a Deep Freeze. Caligo Skin Witch, MVP. I, I have to feel like Federico Ronchi, before the, uh, the Skin Witch started doing its thing, probably felt all right, uh, in, even in spite of that, uh, that snapper. But now, very much on the back foot, casting Divination, hoping to find something to keep him in this. Well, what he needs now is, well, this is aggressive. I was going to say, like, good blockers. Um, this attack uh, could signal that Runchi has, for example, another copy of Wizard's Lightning, so that if Teleroth doesn't block, falling down to three, well, there are three damage burn spells in the format. Um, it's, it's definitely a bit of a suspicious attack, because I was thinking, well, Runchi is at one life, facing down two lethal attackers. He probably wants to line up a double block for the Cold Water Snapper. So then getting in with his Journey Mage here, that is uh, aggressive. Sending a message, but I mean, the messages coming from either side of him on his team, Enrico Badrati and Marco Malatesta, each having won their game once, he just wants to catch up with his buddies. 
Yeah, but do you jump block here with the Skin Witch? It might also just be kind of a, a bluff. Perhaps Runchi has nothing, is just trying to do something. Ah, okay. Well, it's drawn out a vicious offering, and I have to think that the door's closing on uh, Federico here. Syncopate <laughs> stopping the vicious offering. Okay, well, still the question, do you block? There's still a card lurking in Runchi's hand. Could it be a Wizard's Lightning, for example? Perhaps a run amok, that's also a possibility if you don't block. But that Caligo Skin Witch, I mean, it is one power, but with Ronchi at one, you'd love to keep it around. It's not an easy call here, whether you uh, block or not. Yeah, this is a, a really interesting one. Ooh, and looks like Ronchi didn't really have anything. And <laughs> There's Teferi off the top, why not? That enough, of course, to clear a path, allowing Alexa Tellerov to pick up the first game win for his team. All of these teams now shuffling up, potentially getting started in their game twos. Right now, though, Baldrati, Ronchi and Malatesta, <laughs> they lead. They've got two game ones in their favor compared to just one for Alexa Tellerov, who, flanked by Panagiotis Papadopoulos and Stefan Sucic, is currently the only person with a game under his belt. And did you see what Tellerov did there when he grabbed the sideboard? The first thing that he saw was another Cold Water Snapper and he put it down immediately. That card really overperformed. It's not easy to beat both a kicked fight with fire and an in Bolas's clutches that was still in his opponent's hands, but hey, the hexproof creature does get it done. All right, so we're back to uh, Baldrati and Papadopoulos here. No early Song of Frailies for Baldrati this time, but his board's still looking pretty good. Uh, got that Mammoth Spider alongside a lot of Saprolings uh, and indeed uh, Lamar Elves that potentially powered things out. Still leave Champion on the other side of things for Panagiotis Papadopoulos. In principle, a great attacker against Saproling decks, but in the face of a Mammoth Spider, the best it can secure is a trade, uh, and he may find that he wants to hang back until he can do something better. For example, finishing off his Song of Frailies. Yeah, well, it wouldn't necessarily be a trade. The Spider is a 3-5 and the Steel Leaf Champion is a 5-4. So Baldrati would have to block with the Dead Bloom Tallet as well. Um, but yeah, here we see Slimefoot along with Song of Freelies. This match is definitely going to come down to uh, this little song over there. And if one of these players had enchantment removal to get rid of the song before it hit the chorus, Wow, that would be a very big deal indeed. Does not appear to be the case here. Yeah, I think Baldrati is going to get a taste of his own medicine. That uh, song proved so good for him in the previous game. Well, now he's going to be on the receiving end. Guessing that this one does not taste great. No, I uh, Well, here it's going to put counters onto everything. I guess you can respond by making a token with Slimefoot so that that creature also gets the counter. Depends on what else you might have to do with uh, your mana. Oh, looks like Papa Duplos has something better to do with uh, the four mana. And as always, after the last verse of the song goes off, easiest alpha strike ever. When we refer to alpha striking, we're talking about just attacking with everybody and not really worrying about the consequences too much. In this case, there's no need to worry because all of that vigilance means that functionally the only thing that's changing is your opponent's board situation. Yep, and thanks to Indestructible, well, there's nothing that can really go wrong. Even if Baldrati would block uh, a creature with uh, his knight, uh, sure, it has first strike, but that's not going to matter through Indestructible. Yeah, the, the Mammoth Spider is the only creature that can actually block something and survive. And, yeah, as we also saw in the previous game, jump blocking some big attackers with a Zeppelin token that's also not going to help because of Trample. In total, the amount of power that's currently coming Baldrati's way is... Let's see... I am counting 19. And the Steel so Leaf Champion, very tricky to block. It's interesting. I don't know whether or not I feel better about losing to a Song of Frailies that you get to see coming for a few turns or an overrun that simply gets you. I think that the, inev the numbing inevitability of a Song of Frailies might actually be even more painful <laughs> than someone just tapping five mana and casting overrun. Because you see your inevitable doom coming? Yeah, I guess. I mean, sometimes you can deal with it, which is lovely, but those times are not necessarily all times. Mm. 
In Song of Freely, it does need some setup with uh, preferably some creature token makers. But uh, there are a lot of those in, in white, for example, the Call the Cavalry. Also in black with, well, for example, Death Bloom Talit. Uh, and even in green red, it fits quite well because it gives you the mana to uh, cast all of your expensive kicker spells. And just and in case there wasn't enough, we also happen to have Multani in the mix. That is also got to be one of the better cards uh, in the set as a whole. Currently with five lands, it's uh, just a 5-5, five five, but 5-5 well, five five reach trample, that's a good deal. Thing is, it's just never going to die. Unless you manage to exile it, I guess, with Blessed Light, for example, it's always going to return from the graveyard. And that enough for Enrico Baldrati to pick up his cards. We will be seeing a game three between these two. Uh, maybe we'll have a game where neither player draws uh, their Song of Freilies <laughs> and we get to see how things work out in that strange topsy-turvy land that may somewhere exist. Yeah, I mean, it is 1-1 one, one in uh, the actual match, but uh, it's uh, Song of Freilies 2, no song, 0. Always better when you're singing. And here we get to see Federica Ronchi against uh, Alexa Tellerov once more. Uh, Ronchi battling back after having lost game one. Uh, elects to put cards in Tellerov's graveyard there as he plays Way to Memory. Yeah, Tellerov seems to be uh, a bit landlight. And it seems like he already had to discard multiple times to hand size. Not having drawn a mana to be able to cast any of his uh, spells pretty much. Let's yeah. hope there is a land on top so we get like a real game. I guess Kittering Surveyor is kind of a land, a bit I mean, slow. It makes sure that he finds specifically an island so that he has all of the colors available. Yeah, so now if you're Runchy, you know that uh, Teleros hand is all spells, all good stuff. Now he has the mana uh, to actually use it, so you have to be fast. Uh, you're probably going to lose to such a stacked hand in the, in the long game, so you have to keep up the pressure. Preferably deploy another creature and then hope to uh, remove the next couple of plays of, uh, of Telerov. Five mana. That is a journey mage who is a little awkward bouncing uh, a skittering surveyor because when you know that your opponent probably still needs to get more lands, offering them an opportunity to is a little awkward, though it's an opportunity to that essentially means that Alexa Telerov would not be doing very much on his turn. Yeah, it's not ideal, but uh, it's indeed likely that Teleroth doesn't have the time to deploy that Scattering Surveyor. And you definitely want to increase your clock. Um, but it looked like Teleroth had the removal spells to decrease that clock to precisely zero. Deep Freeze briefly staying in play, but getting the Ooh. Deep Freeze itself bounced This there is aggressive. Usually you would bounce your own creature, so you can get it back for good. But... Um, Runchy probably also recognizes that uh, while well putting Telerov down to four can already be uh, quite potent. And Telerov is easily bottlenecked on mana. He has all these spells in hand with not enough mana to ca cast them. So then bouncing an opposing permanent could even be better. This way around, just four points of damage need to be found somewhere from this red-blue deck. And we know that there are various <laughs> uh, ways of doing that. This one will work. Blink of an eye all round, but a syncopate on Blink of an eye, I enough for Federico Ronchi to be able to get through there. That was a really interesting sequence of plays. Ronchi there correctly identifying that when normally bouncing a creature that's under a deep freeze is the exciting way around of doing it, he had exactly the right tempo plan with multiple copies of Blink of an eye mm -hmm. to be able to get those hits in where he needed. Nice play from him. Yeah, uh, I, I do think he recognized exactly what he needed to do to, uh, to win this game. And precisely when you have two copies of Blink of an Eye and then also a counter spell to deal with uh, some potential removal, um, it's just the correct line to, uh, to try to win the game. So Card advantage be damned. We get a chance to see Marco Malatesta against Stefan Suchik. Uh, this is the red-white mirror and worth noting that in all three of the matches going on between these two teams, we are going to a deciding game. Very mm -hmm. tense stuff, very close at these top tables. We've seen a lot of games go to time. With 30 minutes left, I would hope that we're going to see all three or at least two of these matches completed to get a, an eventual victor. Uh, on one side of things, we have a Mesa Unicorn and that uh, Benelish Honor Guard. On the other side of things, uh, we have Pegasus Corsa, Jousting Lance, and that Knight of Grace. Yeah, and the Mesa Unicorn is uh, equipped with Shield of the Realm, 
which means that uh, if any source would deal damage to it, uh, two of that damage gets prevented. Uh, so it could uh, attack pretty much on a post and make sure that Suzic can exploit the lifelink ability on, uh, on the Unicorn. An interesting card, that one. Not necessarily one that I've seen in play a great deal. But in this sort of circumstance where, especially if you put it on a big creature that can only reasonably be multiple blocked, it becomes very difficult to actually kill that creature. Yeah, in general it's not the most exciting equipment, but uh, red-white is the color combination that cares the most about uh, equipment. There's uh, in red, for example, Velduk, uh, a creature that uh, gets much better when you have uh, some equipments attached to it. Also, uh, Champion of the Flame and the red-white gold uncommon also references uh, equipments. So it is the type of uh, archetype where even mediocre equipments can find uh, a nice role. Champion of the Flame there. Very happy to get equipped, as is indeed Valdok of the Flame. And Tiana, the other card that is uh, very happy for there to be a little bit of extra or equipment. There we go, our ship's caretaker. Yep. Actually, interesting attack. Uh, attacking with the Mesa Unicorn into the four power first striking knight. Um, if Susic had literally nothing and Malatesta had blocked, then it would have been, uh, well, a jump attack. The Unicorn would have just died. But given that Susic does dare to attack, he is representing some kind of palm spell or maybe a Gideon's Reproach. And it does look like he has run a mock in hand, if I spot uh, it correctly among his red cards, which would explain uh, why he was brave enough to attack, and also why Malatesta was uh, a bit afraid to block there. Yeah, these are the mind games that we, we see taking place once you've got players at a certain level, and by the time we're talking about in, contest, in, uh, in the running to make top eight, oh sorry, top four at a GP, that certainly is the case. So, attacks here, uh, Pegasus Coursers dallying with another in the sky. Still getting in for four. Ah, and Goblin Barrage finally taking care of uh, the Unicorn. I guess two damage is still prevented, but hey, it deals uh, more than enough. Quite like Goblin Barrage. Uh, yes, it's sorcery speed. Yes, getting the kick against gets quite expensive cards-wise, but... Four damage is four damage, and if you can get both halves of it, then it's pretty potent. Also, if you happen to be playing a red-green deck that's got lots of things that key off kicker, mm. it's a kicker that doesn't require lots of extra mana. Yeah, I wouldn't really uh, like try to build around the, the kicker when I have this card. Uh, four damage to an opponent is not that important, especially when the base rate of four damage to a creature for four mana is already perfectly fine. But, you know, it's, it's nice a nice little bonus uh, to tack on. Quende, the other addition to the battlefield for Steven Suchik. Uh, that one, obviously, if he was the one with the uh, a lance, a jousting lance in play, he would have an easy way of granting double strike. As things stand, he's going to have to find some other way of achieving uh, double strike for his other creatures, or just contenting himself with having a single 2-2 with double strike, which is already pretty good when you already have mm. a Pegasus Corsair on the battlefield. You know what's good with Quende? Run amok. Uh, if Susic actually has the plus three, plus three in hand, turning it into a five-five double striker, that is uh, that's pretty scary. Especially if uh, Malatesta decides to uh, block Pegasus on Pegasus, which is kind of the the obvious block here. Uh, yeah, Quende flying, so it cannot be blocked by Mesa Unicorn. If Malatesta just goes for the obvious block of Pegasus on Pegasus, well, he might lose to uh, Runamuk. Looks like he does block Quende here. I like Trying that block. to uh, preserve his life total as much as possible. I guess that even without the worry of run amok, there's still this nagging doubt that if you allow yourself to, uh, to take four from Quende there, you're on six and there's still a uh, Pegasus Courser in play and you can potentially just find yourself so far behind in the race that it's difficult to come back. So the life totals 12 to 9 in Stefan Suchik's favor here. Uh, and Suchik with rather more creatures on the battlefield as well. Yeah, Malatesta in uh, kind of a rough spot here. Um, you do want to be attacking when you have Pegasus Corsair and Jousting Lands. They're both better when you are on the offense on your own turn. But yeah, I don't think he'll be able to set up uh, a lethal attack on this turn or even over the course of two turns, it may be tough. 
And he does have to, uh, you know, make sure that he has enough decent blockers. I guess putting the lance on the unicorn does give you a bit of a life buffer. Um, boosting the power of life linkers is always good. Sending them into the air even better. Um, but this could be uh, a big attack from uh, Susic. Let's see if Susic can couple together 13, uh, 13 damage. Well, picking up a Shivan Fire there, very nice indeed. Well, Atesta is representing, for example, Gideon's Reproach or Shivan Fire with his uh, untapped mana. Susic has to be uh, careful about that. Maybe that's also why he's putting uh, the shield onto his uh, Quende first. Test the waters is to see if there's a Shivan Fire coming. Plays his own Shivan Fire to clear a path. 13 damage to deal. And now we find out Healing Grace, not a card that you necessarily expect to see too terribly often, but working very nicely here. It does. Uh, I mean, after 25 years of power creep, finally an improvement on uh, the old Healing Solve from, uh, I think, even Alpha, where we had, uh, you know, Ancestral Recall and Dark Ritual, Giant Growth, Lightning Bolt. Healing Solve was a bit of the, the odd one out. There we have it. Um, I mean, at least now we have Healing Grace, which is effectively this with the word or replaced by and. Makes it better. Still not great. Unless you have Lich's Mastery in play, in which Ooh. case, woo, it's Ancestral <laughs> Recall. Then it is Plus pretty prevent sweet. three damage. But uh, let's see if this could be lethal, because that Healing Grace not only saved the knight, but also buffered Malatesta's life total to 16. Uh, if Susic attacks with everything, sends uh, Quende into the air. If he also has run amok and Malatesta has nothing but blocks one of, uh, blocks, I guess, the Benelish Honor Guard, it is going to be exactly 15. One off. If it is with run amok, Quende would deal 10. Uh, the creature on the far right of the board would get blocked and then there's five additional coming through. So that's exactly 15. Man, this game is close. Well, here's the big attacks. It may be that Stefan Suchik here feeling mm. like his best bet is to get into this red zone. And this is actually a nice one, sending the honor guard into the air instead. So, given that the equipment is on Quende, it's not as appealing as a blocker. So if Malatessa now instead blocks, say, the blood-crazed goblin, uh, and Susic has run amok, it is, it is suddenly exactly 16, because he sent his three power creature into the air. Benelish Honor Guard keys off of uh, Quende. Oh, nice play. Marco Malatesta here being put to the test. Desperately trying to find the correct way to get through this attack step. On the face of things, it doesn't look like he's facing lethal, but... We know that that could be one spell away. Could be exactly lethal. But Malatessa doesn't even have a good way of playing around the run amok then, I don't think. Like, what are you going to do? If, if you're going to block Quende, that's not going to change it, because run amok gives, uh, gives trample as well as the plus three plus three boost. And there is the run amok. Let's double check our maths. 10 coming from Quende, 12. 13, 14, 15, 16 damage. Yeah, exactly 16. Uh, yeah, looks like Susic ran the numbers, made the correct play of uh, giving his Benalic Honor Guard wings instead of Quende, and that did it. Well, just as well he did, because Enrico Beldrati has won his uh, match against Panagiotis Papadopoulos. Did it relatively fast. We don't know if there was a song involved, but I'm sure there's <laughs> a spring in Enrico's step at this point. Then the singing will only get louder if Federico Ronchi is able to win his deciding game against Alexa Teleroff, the very last game in this matchup. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see if he is able to beat both uh, Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, and Karn in, uh, in the same deck. Well, I mean, only one of the two Planeswalkers is there, but uh, that's a lot of cards under uh, under car in sign of Urza. Including Teferi. <laughs> oh, boy. Though right now there is not a Planes in Aww. play for Alexa Tellerov, so it may be that he's not greatly incentivized to uh, grab that Planeswalker Doesn't out he have one from in Khan's magic bag. I think he has a Planes in hand. Okay, fair enough. Yep. 
it could be the challenge of the super friends, but look at the creature that's in play on the other side of the battlefield. Oh, yes. We've got ourselves a snapper. There we go. But, uh, well, I mean, the snapper did a lot of work in, uh, in an earlier game, I guess, on, uh, on the other side. Uh, on 20 life with two planeswalkers in play, though? Yeah. Wait, is he not going to play Defery? Boo. There's still time. We got some snapper on snapper action before that. I guess. Alexa Tellerov, very patient with his, uh, with his list. It's got a lot of removal. It's got these planeswalkers that, given appropriate time, will be able to close out games. Uh, we saw him there using the minus one to put a card with a silver counter on it, which are the ones underneath uh, Khan into his hand, that one being Teferi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like this, uh, this seems to be a spot where Tellerov wants to literally turtle up and uh, protect his planeswalkers for the time being. He did see powerful cards uh, from Ranchi in previous games, like uh, in Bolas's Wings or Fight with Fire that uh, he has to contend with in, uh, in the long game. But uh, it does look like he is uh, still at a relatively safe life total, has his defense locked up with, uh, with the snapper, and might be in a position where he can ride uh, a team of planeswalkers to victory if all goes well. So here is a kick to fight with fire. That's enough to kill both uh, Khan and some of the creatures in play for Alexa Tellerov. And worth noting that in Bola's clutches, if it comes along, can steal planeswalkers. Yep. In fact, that seems like one of the most Bolasian <laughs> things to do. Yeah, that seems pretty evil indeed. Um, and actually, the, the presence of Fight with Fire may also be a reason why Tellerov didn't want to play Teferi on the previous turn, because then he would expose both planeswalkers to, uh, to the burn spell. Well, we will find out whether or not Teferi, hero of Dominaria, can do what Khan couldn't and take Federico Ronchi out of this game. It must be a funny moment during deck building where inevitably <laughs> when someone opens up a, a planeswalker, they kind of wave it around to the rest of the team and feel pretty good about it. And then another player on the same team does the same thing but with a different planeswalker. I wonder how much of a fight Alexa Tellerov had to put up in order to be able to get both of them on his side. I wonder if uh, he just saw both of the planeswalkers and yelled shotgun. Yep, all mine. <laughs> I'll take them. You figure out the rest. I'll just build decks with these. <laughs> no, it was probably just the best configuration to uh, to put their planeswalkers into their three decks. But would have been fun if that would have been actually the way it played out. So Caligai Skinwitch coming down with Kicker here. I believe there's another copy or two indeed in uh, Alexa Teleros' hand. So he's aiming at clearing out the hand of Federico Monchi, making it that much more difficult for any kind of comeback against all of these planeswalkers. Yep. Yeah, and now Ronchi is left without any action. Uh, in no good position to really pressure uh, the planeswalkers. Like he can attack with both of his four power creatures, but then the, the Cyclops will get blocked by the Snapper, and the Snapper will, will get jump blocked by a Sepperling. Uh, we may have a game where we see uh, Teferi go ultimate and then eventually uh, take over the game. I guess even the ultimate cannot uh, deal with Coldwater Snapper. Nothing can. It turns out you can be one of the most powerful planeswalkers <laughs> around. <laughs> but a turtle? No, that's too much. Big old turtle. Yep. He, he can't even see it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's hiding from him. It looks like a rock when it's got its head in its body. Mm. Just yep. a big old rock. Why would you, why would you do anything about that? Raf Capuchin flying through the air with the greatest of ease, attacking Federico Ronchi's life total in multiples of threes. And yeah. Federico Ronchi here, he's got a memorial. It comes into play tapped, but at some point that might uh, do a little bit of work for him here. Now one thing that uh, Alexa at this point may have to worry about is uh, if he ticks up Teferi, goes up to 8, passes the turn. If then Ronchi draws, or maybe already has, in Bolas's clutches, he can actually steal the Planeswalker and immediately ultimate. Oh, but wow! Settle the score? That, 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 that evades that whole line of, uh, of play. Now Teferi can ultimate on this turn already. Wow. I like it. Putting two counters on a Planeswalker you control. If ever... 
<laughs> which colour do we think that we should put the, 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 the two planeswalkers in? Maybe we should put it in the deck that's got Settler Score that can put two loyalty on a planeswalker. I like it. I mean, maybe this came up in, uh, in deck construction and someone said, come on, that's never going to happen. But, well, here it is. Yeah, I mean, now if Imbola's Clutches comes along, yes, it <laughs> means that uh, uh, Federico Ronchi briefly has Teferi. But then as soon as uh, Alexa Tellerov draws a card, he gets to exile target permanent, which could just be that Teferi if he really wants. Yep. Or indeed the Imbola's Clutches to get his Teferi back. <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, going to be tough for Ranchi to come back from, especially with Telerov still at 20 life. If Telerov would have been at, say, 10 life, maybe Ranchi could have drawn Gitu Chronicler, get back Fight with Fire, and use it as a burn spell to, uh, to finish the game. But with Telerov still at 20 life, I, I'm just not sure how he's going to beat uh, the Emblem. Well, Blink uh, of an Eye turns into 4 mana, draw a card, and oh yeah, also exile something. I guess taking out the card draw from the blue memorial is uh, is the biggest threat here. Also, I, I also like how well the emblem of uh, Tefri works with uh, his own puzzle box. Tefri's puzzle box, a uh, card from probably 20 or well 20 ish years ago. So it has been uh, it has taken Tefri quite a while to figure out his own puzzle box, but uh, it does work well with the emblem. And there is the handshake, and of course, followed up by a whole bunch more handshakes. Alexa Tellerov getting the win for his team. Uh, Stefan Suchik, of course, also getting a win. Two wins, all you need in that, and that means that they are still rocking and rolling as they advance ever closer to the final stages of our tournament here in Bologna. Now, the way that that works is once we get down to our final four, it's no longer about building sealed deck. It is about team draft. Very excited to be able to bring you some of that later on. But before that, we do have some more magic to show you. Uh, we will have plenty more from our time walk matches right after these messages.
Hello and welcome back to the coverage of Grand Prix Bologna. I'm Tim Willoughby, this is Frank Carsten, and we are very rapidly approaching the end of our round here at Grand Prix Bologna. That doesn't mean to say that we haven't found a little bit more magic for you though. A quick update for you, just so you know, the Finnish team that has been doing so well in the standings thus far won their round this round. That means that they are presumptively in our final four with a record of X1 at this point. It seems very difficult to imagine them not making it in now without some sort of awful calamity. Uh, but we have another match to bring you as well for another team that's hoping to be able to make it into that final four and get to do a bit of drafting as we get to the latter stages on Sunday. Let's head back down to our feature match area for more magic here from Grand Prix Bologna. So here we have David Besso, Matteo Cerigliano, and, and with Giovanni the way that the draws Gessio. have been panning out, we think that even if you miss the uh, X2 up two record, Andre it's still Ruta, potentially Robin possible Dola might be able to make the Tetschnik. So Robin Dolar is uh, perhaps the most experienced player in uh, this entire match. Has been a pro to regular, multiple GP winner, and uh, well, he brought some uh, some friends. Davor the Tetschnik, uh, they've been going to pro to together. Andre Rutar as well. Basically, team uh, well Slovenia. Uh, in terms of uh, decks, well. Uh, these names might be... Oh, no, uh, never mind. I thought the names were swapped. Uh, Matteo Sirigliano is playing uh, black-red. Just a, well, an average kind of uh, deck with uh, Goblin Chain Whirler as a standout card, but not that many mountains, only nine. And Kazarov Sengir Pureblood, the black seven drop that uh, can take over a late game. Robin Dolar, uh, in the meantime, had uh, a very strong deck, looking at his deck list. Two copies of Adelis, the Cinderwind, the red-blue uh, gold card, and also some late-game power in both Zahid, Jin of the Lamp, and Siege Gang Commander as powerful rares. Siege Gang Commander at its very best in a red-blue deck where there's the potential to rebuy it if need be with Blink of an Eye and so on. Caligo Skinwitch, currently the only play from Matteo Serigliano at this point in the game getting beaten down a little bit by uh, that Academy Drake in the air. But he now does have a rampaging Cyclops on the ground who will be able to meet back some amount of damage and put a real race in here. Well, Dolar's hand is uh, stacked with action. Not a whole lot of lands. Uh, I do see a Time of Ice, the, the blue saga that he could put down on this turn to lock down the Cyclops and uh, buy himself some time for his uh, more powerful cards. Also see Sheevan fire, but uh, yeah, no good targets. You do need to kick that. Uh, Haphazard bombardment, I believe. If he ever gets to uh, six mana, gets to destroy, well, three permanents. And a Gitu Chronicler, another card that is nice when you hit six mana and can return some instant or sorcery from your graveyard. I do like the time of ice here. I like the way that it interacts with uh, potentially getting that haphazard bombardment online. It buys you a bunch of time in which to get up to six mana. Uh, icing down that uh, Cyclops now, so it's tapped. It won't untap next turn, uh, or it won't untap indeed while the Song of Ice is in play. Once we get to verse number three of the song, of the time of ice, sorry, uh, then we will find that <laughs> all of the tapped creatures on the battlefield get bounced to their owner's hands. Yeah, so that won't really provide any kind of card advantage. Uh, it's just a tempo play to uh, perhaps trade four mana for well more mana on uh, Mateo's side. And yeah, it also buys you some time and some turns to find your fifth and sixth land, because that is what Dolar is currently looking for. Now, if you're Robin Dolar here, is there a temptation perhaps to tap the Rampaging Cyclops a second time with Time of Ice if there's no new creature added to the battlefield because bouncing a skin witch does not seem to mm -hmm. me to be quite what you want to be doing when your opponent is fast approaching six mana. Yeah, that might actually be a reasonable play. Um, yeah, you're not forced to uh, tap some some uh, something like a Caligo skin witch. I think I like that because you'd rather see the 1-3 the in play than a Caligo skin witch in your opponent's hand. Sometimes uh, can you actually target creatures of your own? I've never even done that, but now I'm curious whether that is possible. No, it's only Aww. creatures your opponents control. So you can't reuse, uh, you know, abilities of your own creatures. Too bad. It looks like Robin just figuring out the details of how he wants to play this. A 
I think he drew Zahid, Jin of the Lamp. It's not quite uh, the land that he was looking for, but uh, it's perhaps even better. A 5-6 flyer, which uh, he can cast for 4 mana thanks to that uh, Blood Tallow Candle. It's, uh, after a bunch of years of power creep on Mahamoti Jin, uh, we now get effectively a Mahamoti Jin with uh, a cost discount and a legendary rider as well. That can be a benefit in this, uh, in this format. 5-6. Flying for four mana. Well, what are you going to do about it, Matteo? And the Calico skin, which did untap there, it was a double targeted Rampaging Cyclops. Yep. Yeah, I like that play. Worth being aware that that's an option going mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like there are tons of creatures that you don't want to bounce to your opponent's hand, but those that have Kicker definitely qualify. Eviscerate, dealing with the Gin of the Lamp in relatively straightforward fashion. And it is time for that Rampaging Cyclops to get bounced to hand. It's, so it's interesting, it's hard to know exactly how much impact the Time of Ice had there because it may very well be that Matteo Sirigliano was incentivized to hold back on casting creatures so that there weren't <laughs> going to be more creatures to get bounced there. Well, if you're not really doing anything else with your mana, you would probably just uh, play a creature anyway. But uh, I guess he was casting removal spells in the meantime, so then it uh, is still fine. Adelie's the Cinder Wind coming down. So Dollar is not drawing the lands that he was hoping for, but at least he is drawing uh, cards that uh, he can cast with uh, the lands he has available. Meanwhile, Matteo is uh, probably looking for some kind of action, because Matteo will know that Dolar is holding all, all spells. If Dolor had, ha had lands, he would have almost certainly played them. Um, so at that point, you kind of want to have some pressure on the table. Just a lone Caligo Skin Witch is not quite doing it yet. Settle a score there, getting rid of one of the threats on Robin Dolar's side of things. Bit of a staring contest here. Robin Dolar currently well up in terms of life and with a grip full of spells. If he can just find the lands to deploy them, he will put in himself in great shape here. Yeah, he drew Cloud Reader Sphinx, which is <laughs> a little awkward. Another 5-drop that he uh, cannot cast. Um, so, Matteo has a couple of turns to try to deploy some pressure onto the table and then hope that Dolar uh, misses lands for, for a couple turns. Because I do feel that if this game goes any longer, then uh, Dolar's stacked hand should give him uh, ultimately the game. I mean, even just looking at the battlefield, as soon as Robin Dolar hits six mana, then that candle will be something more than ornamental. Uh, obviously, there was a Djinn of the Lamp living in it, but <laughs> uh, right now it's just kind of chilling out on the battlefield, not doing too much until that sixth land appears so its activatability can be paid. Well, we know that there is uh, a Cyclops in hand. And once more, it is a non-land on the top of a Robin Dolar's deck. Though this one gives him another opportunity to potentially get into something here. Yeah, so Kelden Raider, uh, you don't have to discard and draw. Sometimes when your hand is uh, already really good and you don't really need anything else, you are going to decline the ability. But here I think Dolar is interested in discarding you know, something in order to get closer to uh, some extra lands. Discards the Hap Haphazard Bombardment. I guess that when there's already eight lands in play for your opponent, the ability for it to cause major disruption is diminished somewhat. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, we've seen Haphazard Bombardment target four lands multiple times uh, over the course of the day, and that has proven to be very powerful. But uh, if Robin were to cast it in this spot, obviously he would be targeting creatures or uh, perhaps some other non-land permanents that uh, Matteo would play. I guess, however, that uh, Robin is thinking, well, if my opponent is adding more threatening cards to the board, I, I'm going to uh, use my removal spells, right, the Sheev Sheevan Fire or the Blood Tallow Candle to take care of him that way, way before I'm going to allow him to have, you know, four threatening permanents on the battlefield that I'm going to target with Haphazard Bombardment. Well, Wizards of Lightning men means that this uh, Cyclops Still very happy to hit the red zone and unable to be double blocked. Oh, well, that's first blood. First damage that uh, Matteo manages to deal. 
And a Gita Chronicler means that I think that's a settler score coming back for Matteo Sirigliano. <laughs> it probably... Uh, it usually doesn't matter whether you bring back Settle the Score or Eviscerate, assuming you already have enough uh, black mana. Although, <laughs> we just saw the two additional loyalty counters actually matter in the, in the previous game, with uh, Alexa Tellerov uh, suddenly getting uh, ready for a Teferi ultimate. No Planeswalkers here. I don't think Mateo has any Planeswalkers in his deck. Let me just double check. No, I don't see any cards. Mm, don't spot any Planeswalkers here. Not to worry, I'm sure that he's got plenty of other action going on. Robin Dola, though, five lands available, a wealth of options. Let's see which one he goes with. Well, I have to imagine that you're starting with a removal spell for the Rampaging Cyclops. At this point, Dolar's hand seems you know, pretty stacked with action. Um, he has Gitu Chronicler to get something back once he hits uh, six mana. Uh, the Cloud Reader Sphinx to make sure that he's not going to flood out anytime soon. So my thought if I were in his seat would be to uh, you know, try to preserve my life total for as long as possible. Playing the Cloud Reader Sphinx or some other creature is somewhat appealing as well. But uh, you know that uh, Matteo just brought back a removal spell. You would be taking 4 damage from the Cyclops uh, in the process. So I like playing it more defensively here. Oh, and also, uh, it, uh, it triggers Bloodstone Goblin, which uh, gets a small boost when you kick a spell. Yeah, it gets plus one, plus one, and Menace. Uh, that enough to mean that the attacks from Robin Dola are not ones that Matteo Sirigliano really wants to be considering blocking too hard. Mm. So the life total is 9 to 16 now in Robin Dola's favor, and we can see that there have not been any results from elsewhere on the tables just yet. Uh, these teams do need to watch out a little bit uh, for draws. There's been a, a large number of them in this tournament, and at some point they really do add up and they can cost you uh, a chance to be in the elimination stages. Yeah, Besso, Sirigliano, Gessio is at 29 points going into this round. Rutar Dolar, the Tetschnik, at 28 points. Uh, Notably, neither of those numbers multiples <laughs> of three. No, that's uh, that's true. But for both teams, it probably means that they have to win this match and then probably the next one uh, in order to make it to the top four. Well, Maybe. Cloud Reader Sphinx there from Robin Dolar revealed Siege Gang Commander as one of the options on the top of his deck. Can I can only imagine that that one stayed there. <laughs> yeah, I guess you keep uh, one of the best rares in the, in the format. And... Well, Matteo Sirigliano, he's going to go big, he's going to go wide, he's going to get his legendary creature down. Every time you get one of the signal uh, color combination legendaries, you know it's going to be pretty good in your deck. Garner the Blood Flame. Obviously, if it can get creatures back from the graveyard when it comes into play, that's lovely. Uh, but even just as a flash 3-3 three, three for 5 that gives other creatures you control haste, it does now set up a potentially pretty big turn for him this mm. turn. I mean, you'd love to uh, play it when you have just jump blocked with both Gitu Chronicler and the Caligo Skin Witch, so you can get them back and then recast them with Kicker. That, that's pretty sweet. But uh, not really sure Matteo has all that uh, much time. And just playing a 3 3 creature that also grants other creatures haste uh, might be his best route to victory. You know, somehow trying to cobble together a win before Robin has uh, the opportunity to cast all of his powerful cards. So, getting some swings in where he can here. No additional creatures to give haste before combat, so it's just these attacks, and that's going to be 4 damage going through Roy and Dolar, dropping to 12 on that attack. And hey, look who it is! Siege Gang Commander. One of the more exciting reprints in, uh, in Dominaria. Already been brewing with uh, that card in Standard. Can definitely uh, do some work together with uh, Skirk Prospector, that's another reprint uh, that came back. Yeah, big fan of Skirk Prospector as well. More so in Constructed than Limited, I must say, but there are a few <laughs> cool combos that you can do that even in Limited work out all right with the Skirk Prospector. Yeah, and the reason why it's such a good card in Limited is that, uh, well, it represents a total of 8 damage to be distributed uh, pretty much as you please over the course of the next uh, turns. And even if the opponent has a removal spell for Siege Gang Commander itself, 
it still leaves behind three goblins that can, you know, jump block something or get into uh, into the red zone. So it's a lot of value, uh, lots of damage potential, and spread out across multiple bodies. Ooh, but this is a sweet play. The threaten effect of uh, Keldon Marauder taking over the Siege Gang Commander. And now, well, Sirigliano can, uh, can attack for a bunch, and then post-combat actually sacrifice Siege Gang Commander so that uh, Dolar doesn't actually get it back. I like this a lot. This yeah. is a great play here from Matteo Sirigliano, who was otherwise in a very tricky spot against that Siege Gang Commander. Yeah, but this might, uh, might change the game around a little bit. Question is, do you attack with, uh, with everything? That's going to be somewhat dangerous, given that Matteo is still sitting at 7 life himself. And also offering the Kelden Marauder as uh, you know, uh, a trade between Kelden Marauder and a 1-1 Goblin token. Also not as appealing. But I guess if Urban Dollar goes for that, then he cannot, say, triple block Garnot the, the Blood Flame. Which would be kind of a weird triple block anyway, because of the potential of Siege Gang Commander dealing some damage mid-combat. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those situations where the all-out attack doesn't necessarily represent anything lethal, but it's really going to devastate uh, Robin Dolar's board here, yeah. regardless of how they block. And his life total is certainly not irrelevant in this set of decisions. I mean, there's, what, 3, 6, uh, 8, 9, 10 exactly 12 being threatened here so some blocking has to happen yeah i like the all out uh, all out attack just uh force the decisions onto dolar i don't think dolar is going to be in a position to uh crack back for lethal on the next turn so it's uh it's fairly safe and yeah even though you might get well an unfavorable trade between the kelden marauder and the goblin token it's gonna happen at some point in the future most likely and you are getting in for relevant damage in the process David Besso has picked up his game one against Andre Ruta. Uh, so for the team of Besso, Sirigliano and Gesult, they are already just the one game up. Uh, plenty more play in this time walk match. Yeah. I think Dollar is thinking about whether or not he wants to jump block uh, Garna the Blood Flame uh, as well, just to preserve his life total. Double blocking Siege Gang Commander. I guess that's also a possibility because... This gives Sirigliano the option between either, you know, letting damage happen and then taking down two goblins. But then he doesn't have the opportunity to uh, ping down the Bloodstone goblin anymore. Um, yeah, I guess this is... Uh, preserves some life points as well. And probably makes sure that the Bloodstone goblin survives. Which could be a more valuable blocker than just a couple of uh, goblin tokens. I mean, Sirigliano also has the uh, uh, the option of you know, still sacrificing it to uh, kill the goblin. Well, but then at least a double block by Dolar prevents the two damage uh, dealt by Siege Gang Commander in, uh, in combat damage. All right, so it's seven life apiece, and we are now back to our reg regularly scheduled programming. Robin Dolar finds his sixth land right on time. Yeah, now what? Uh, well, you probably just want to kill uh, Garna the Blood Flame. That is the most threatening card. Also, it gives it it gives any new creatures haste. Uh, you could just spend the Blood Tallow Candle on that, and then yeah, I guess take two from the two one three creatures. That's still fine. Eh. This feels a little dangerous to make the the Sphinx here, because now if Sirigliano draws. Uh, well, a removal spell, you might be taking a whole lot of damage. If Sirigliano draws uh, a big creature, it suddenly has haste. But I guess if Sirigliano has nothing, the best case scenario, then this is uh, easily ideal for, uh, for Dolar. So high risk, high reward. We'll see if it uh, backfires or not. Yeah, this next turn is going to be made all the more exciting for the fact that there is that Ghana in play. Gun of the Blood Flame giving haste to any creatures that Matteo Sirigliano chooses to play out in this next turn. Yeah, if Dollar plays it aggressively, he's now also going to swing with goblins, perhaps set up uh, a lethal attack on the next turn. Also, given that he has Idolise, the Cinderwind in hand, 
I still managing somewhere between trying to set up uh, quick attacks and um, still playing it somewhat safe by leaving behind blockers. So Sirigliano there, just double checking whether or not Dola left cards on top. Making sure he's working with the best possible information before he engages in any attacks or anything further. So Sirigliano, well, let's see what he's got going on here. A blood tallow candle of his own and there's easily enough mana to be able to immediately throw that candle at a Sphinx. Yeah, I think this counts as uh, the Sphinx play backfiring. Dollar would have been in a much better position had he used the removal spell on the on the Garna instead. As things stand, three creatures, all of which can very merrily beat up a goblin getting into the red zone. I have to imagine that there's a jump block coming for uh, for Garna. Uh, at the minimum, yeah. I mean, one thing I'll say for Robin Dola, he's very used to playing uh, relatively slow control decks. He can manage his life total as well as just about anyone. And plenty of experience on the Pro Tour doing exactly that. Yep. Yeah, last year he even won, uh, or at least made the top eight at a GP with a blue-black, uh, you know, Scarab God control deck. That's, that's kind of his style. And what's his follow-up here? Has he got... All right, this is, this is kind of interesting. Start off with Adelie's the Cinderwind. If there were a flurry of spells from here, then in principle he could represent quite a bit of damage. Well, there's Gitu Journey Mage that also uh, deals too. So now, perhaps, g given the, the trigger on Adelie's uh, the Cinderwind, if Dolar uh, plays uh, an instant or sorcery on the next turn, uh, that is going to be a lethal attack in the air. Ooh, uh, that's... Does that change things? Yes, it does, because it's four power in the air, and then uh, at least one of the one trees will be uh, unblocked. That's going to be exactly lethal. Looks like uh, those somewhat aggressive plays by, uh, by Dolor have backfired with him, probably losing uh, this game still with plenty of action in hand. Agaros, the empty one, getting in and getting the game for Matteo Sirigliano. We have come back to the booth, and the reason for that is... A pretty exciting reason, really, which is to say that we are very close now on being able to start our final round of the Swiss before we get on to our draft. To give you an idea of how that match finished up, it was actually the team of Robin Dola that was able to succeed in spite of the fact that, yes, Robin was punished in that game for the line of play that he took. But that means that we are now very close indeed. We will have more magic for you soon enough as we have our race towards the top four right after these messages. <laughs> 